Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hello, hello, and welcome to the DJE Podcast. Thanks for joining us for another episode. I really enjoyed this episode. Mike Ayala is our guest, and he's an entrepreneur built and sold a business and has been a real estate investor for many years as well. So we cover kind of his journey starting out in his 20s as an entrepreneur, surrounding himself with some good coaches and consultants that led to him growing that company to an eventual successful exit a number of years ago. And then along the way, getting into real estate investing, single family, and then jumping up to mobile home parks, which he's still very active in today. So we talk about the lessons learned from all of that experience and things like growing and scaling the company, getting into the real estate, growing the real estate. We do talk a lot about mobile home parks in this episode, just because I personally am kind of curious about that since we hear about it all the time. We don't do that like at our firm. So I'm, I'm always interested to hear how, how other shops and how other entrepreneurs are operating and thinking about things. That's one of the reasons I love doing this podcast is just getting to connect with really high quality guys like Mike that have been through a lot and trying to glean lessons and insights from that. So one of my favorite recent episodes here, um, talking to Mike. So we'll have a message from our sponsors. If you're enjoying the DJE podcast, thank you so much for joining us. A five-star review on Apple helps spread the message. So if you could go in there and leave us a five-star review, I'd be extremely grateful for that. And let's hear a message from the sponsors, and then we'll get into the episode with Mike Ayala. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by DJE Texas Management Group, a San Antonio, Texas-based real estate investment firm with a track record of transacting on several hundred million dollars of multifamily land and industrial deals throughout Texas. DJE has been in business for over a decade and is approaching 100 team members in San Antonio. To learn more about DJE, visit djetexas.com or the link in the show notes of this episode. This episode is also brought to you by apartmenteducators.com, a complete ecosystem for professionals to learn how to find, finance, and operate large multifamily properties for profit. You can get started with a free mini course and learn more at apartmenteducators.com or visit the link in the notes. Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. Good to see you. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Look forward yeah, to it. Yeah. Looking forward to it too. Looking forward to diving in and, and talking shop and um, all that good stuff. I think maybe by just to kick it off here for folks that don't already know you, how, you know, how about some background and how you got into real estate and um, always love hearing that, that part of the journey. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, I started a business when I was 24. So I started a plumbing and HVAC company. I was a plumber by trade and um, you know, I found myself as I call it, I was a wage slave and yeah. working literally a hundred hours a week. I was working out of town. My wife's pregnant with our third child. I'm missing my little boys growing up. And oh, so we launched a business. Um, and then, you know, I'll jump to the real estate side. So I quickly found out that I didn't know much about running business. Like I said, I was actually a plumber out of the field. And so I hired, I hired a consulting company in the HVAC industry. Um, and then, so this was probably 2005 by the time I hired them. Mm -hmm. And I went to an annual planning event and as you know, they were, my head coach was actually speaking and he made the comment. He said, if your business isn't helping you achieve your personal goals, you just own a job. And that was like the second moment where it kind of hit me between the eyes. I'm like, you know, if I don't figure out how to, um, you know, grow this business and scale my way out. Um, and naturally I think the progression was real estate. So I had two people kind of squawking in my ears. Number one, my coach, you know, putting me through this, like, you know, if, if time and money didn't matter, you know, what would you have? What would it look like? And so my wife and I, at the age of 25, just started looking at real estate. And um, also my CPA at that point in time, um, we were, that business was profitable from the beginning and we were spinning off cash. And our CPA started just telling us, they're like, you might want to start looking at some real estate investments. And so I had a pretty good CPA, even at, you know, I mean, that was 20 years ago, but um, even then he was saying, you know, you might want to look at some real estate write-offs. And um, so that kind of just set my Kind of set my radar toward real estate and we bought um two single families in 2005 mm -hmm. and that was kind of my goal like two income i we said we'll buy two income producing properties a year 
And I was kind of thinking, Devin, if I could do that for 10 years and I have 20 single families, like that would just be the thing. Right. And yeah, um, we did that the first year. And then the second year we were doing a bunch of work in a mobile home park and they owed us a bunch of money. And the owner was out of Vegas. She was going broke and long story short, we can get into it if you want, but I ended up buying this mobile home park and um, that kind of set me on my trajectory of, you know, understanding the difference between single family, multifamily. Um, by the time I sold that business in 2014, Kara and I had bought 45 single families. We had five mobile home parks. We had three commercial buildings. We just kept, you know, investing the money we were making in real estate. And I was in the right business too, because everywhere we looked like plumbing, heating, like there was, you know, challenge problems. I was picking up flips. I was, um, kind of just right place, right time. So that's how we got uh, the real estate bug. Oh, I love it. Thanks for the overview. A couple of things kind of stuck out to me. It seemed like pretty early on, you were bought into this idea of hiring consultants, mentors, a coach. Um, a lot of people never come to that. A lot of people come to that later in business. What was that for you? I mean, it seems so you're in your 20s and you start this business and, and, and it, I mean, what was the impetus to start kind of surrounding yourself with, with those types of people? You know, I think the easy answer to that is, like I said, I was 24 years old and, you know, I, I came out of the field, like literally the day I started my business, you look backwards, you know, two months and I'm, I'm running a, a crew of 16 on a construction project site. Like I didn't know anything about accounting, sales, marketing, all the business stuff. Obviously yeah. I had some leadership talent. I knew how to be a plumber. Um, I had people skills, but I didn't know any of the rest of it. And so when we opened that business, Devin, I was like, you know, there's that saying that we always talk about, like, if you're the smartest guy in the room, find a bigger room, all, yeah. all the, all those things. Yeah. Right. But I, I actually knew that if I didn't find, like, I was going to be in trouble mm -hmm. if I didn't find, you know, experts in the field. And so I was just on a mission. I think that's the easy answer. I was just on a mission to, you know, figure out how to do accounting and do sales. And I found a, um, an HVAC industry consultant through um, train because I went to a sales training and the company that wrote the sales training manual was called BDR. And my territory rep, her husband worked for BDR. And I think the clues are there a lot of times. I think people just don't see them. So she was like, Hey, Mike, if you want, you know, an intro to BDR, my, my husband's one of the trainers. And, and so to make a long story short, I was like, yes, help me. I'm, I'm like drowning here. I don't know anything about running businesses. And um, so I, I think that's the easy answer, like I said, but I think the more complex part of it is when I look backwards, Devin, um, you know, my dad, my real dad, who my mom finally divorced him when I was eight, he was in and out of my life. He was not really present. He was an alcoholic, drug addict, abusive, all these things. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I look backwards, by the time I was a teenager, um, I started working early and I realized, and it took me a long time to realize this, but I realized that, you know, I, like I had this boss, he was a general manager at Denny's, which was like my first real job. And he just reached out and he just mentored me. And I, I realized immediately that like, I was longing and hungry for like mentorship, which I didn't really have. My mom was a saint by the way, but every time there was a, a, a you know, a, a man in my life as a, as a young guy, like I would just take that mentorship and just devour it. And I think it's cause, you know, I was missing that as a young man. Yeah. Um, and then I think it was just something that you know, I, it, I just took to you so naturally. And so, like I said, the easy answer is when I got into business, but I think the more complex answer is just growing up, not having that leadership and mentoring when I see it, I think I was just so hungry for it that just tell me what to do and I'll do it, which has been a key to my success, but it's also super simple. Yeah. There's a lot in there. I appreciate you sharing that. And it's interesting how uh, some of those early or even childhood challenges set us up for things later. There's things that, uh, there's so many things I look back on that were instrumental for me that were painful at the time. It's so fascinating. I appreciate you taking it that far back. And yeah, I, there's for so many entrepreneurs and I spent so much time, I guess, with ego in the way and trying to figure it all out and I could do it the best. And, you know, the sooner I kind of <laughs> raise my hand and accept some help or get the right team member on board or the right coach or whatever the case is, things just get exponentially better. So that's awesome that you're able to lean into that super early on. I want to dive in on the, on the mobile home park. Um, how, you know, that's a, uh, tell us a little bit about that deal. How different was that from the single family projects you'd already been involved in? Was it, was it a huge leap? Was it like a natural 
extension for what you guys are already doing or how were you guys thinking about it when the, when that came up? It was a huge leap and it yeah. was really, really scary. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, as, as we're talking about this too, like I just realized that I don't know if it's because I'm aware and I'm more open or what, but at every single one of these milestones, you know, Steve Jobs said it, it's so much easier to connect the dots looking backwards. But when I look at that yeah. deal, I had done two single families, which, you know, was a little bit intimidating, but we did it. We got it done, figured it out. When this mobile home park deal fell in my lap, the manager actually called me and he's like, Hey, I know, you know, we haven't paid you to be honest with you. There's some challenges. The owner uh, was, a uh, she was a developer out of Vegas. And so this was like 2000 six going into 2007. Mm -hmm. Um, she was having some troubles and and he said, they're actually getting ready to sell the park. And I'm like, well, do they already have a buyer? And he's like, no, I, they're talking to somebody out of Vegas. It actually has me frustrated. And I'm like, well, I'd be interested. And then, so he connected me with the seller and she says, yeah, so there's a first position note. It's a 7% interest rate, private money lender out of Phoenix. It's assumable. I need $85,000 cash. Um, and I need to close in 15 days. And I'm sitting here thinking like, holy crap, like how am I going to close a mobile home park in 15 days? Like, I don't know anything about mobile home parks. So I said, can I talk to your, you know, the guy that's holding the note, she put me in touch with him. He said, yeah, you know, we had a 15 minute conversation. He said, I'll let you assume it. Um, so I went and saw a mentor of mine, Devin, this was a guy that I had known previously. He had lent me some money when I was starting my business and he used to be the county assessor. He was like a, oh, nice. a, a real estate agent. Um, he had mobile home parks himself, multifamily, all kinds of real estate. So I go see him and I'm like, hey, Barry, look at this deal. And he he literally said to me, you're lucky you're my friend or I would steal this thing. Like this is a home run. And so I'm like talking to him. And so if you put the math together, the first position note was 390. She wanted 85. So it's 475 all in. 72 space mobile home park. And you know, this thing needed some work, but I, the reason why I knew about it was because we had a plumbing company. We were doing a bunch of work in it. Mm -hmm. And so to make a long story short, I didn't have the down payment. So the guy that I was talking to, he said, listen, I'll loan you the $85,000 in second position. He's like, this is a good deal. Go buy this thing. And he's like, if anything goes wrong, I'll just pay off the first position. No. And I'll just get you out of it. I'm like, there's no way I could lose in this deal. Like there yeah, was no. zero, there was, there was no way I could lose. And so I bought that first mobile home park. And um, like I said, you know, all in 475, but the reality is I didn't put a penny into it. We put a bunch of money into it, turning it around. Mm -hmm. um, but that thing cash flowed from day one and I sold it maybe three years ago for 1.65. So that was like my first, you know, venture into mobile home park. So I couldn't have got more lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, you know, sometimes it's, it's better to be lucky than good. So take it when you can get it right. Cause I'm sure, sure you've had some, you know, bumps and scrapes along the way in other, other areas, right? Plenty. Yep. Yep. Well, that's cool. That's a really cool story. And, you know, I, I've, I think all of us real estate investors kind of have that guy or that girl at some point in our career that for me, it was a private lender that gave me my first, you know, hundred thousand dollar loan to, do a, a burr on a house. And I was like, this guy's going to give me a hundred grand. I, you know, he's in first lien, super low leverage. Like he's fine. Yeah. But that like completely opened my eyes to, um, you know, private capital and private investors and eventually equity investors, this whole thing. So it kind of just takes one person sometimes to have a relationship with you and back you. And that, what a cool deal that was. Right. I mean, um, yeah, what a what a hookup for not to steal it from you, then to give you the money for it and kind of kind of see it through. Yeah, uh, you, you know it's crazy too as you're saying that too. I just remember you know thinking back to those early deals and you know getting that first hundred k that you're talking about and you walk out of there and you just got that jittery feeling in your gut and you're like, wow, did that just happen? Like, um, I I miss those days sometimes. <laughs> you know that's such a good point. And I tell people that that are starting new venture like it doesn't feel it. That feeling doesn't scale. You know, we, yeah. I, we were doing like a $25 million apartment building several years ago. And there's a young member on my team and she's like, are you excited? And I was like, no, and this is like a Tuesday due diligence buying yeah. another deal. Like the last one, like the last one before that. And it just kind of, you know, I always think about that. Like what, if you're excited and that's kind of a first time thing. It, that's not going to be that way forever. Yeah. And and you're going to scale up if you choose to do that. And it's that feeling doesn't scale. So, you know, if you're listening, enjoy those firsts because there's really something special about that, um, which is, which is interesting. So 
you got that done. Um, and it doesn't sound like mobile home parks were, you know, uh, this strategic asset class that you're pursuing, just kind of an awesome deal fell into your lap. Did you guys, um, end up pursuing a bunch of those? Did you, you know, what did your real estate kind of track look like after getting into that deal? Um, I didn't specifically pursue mobile home parks, but like I said, we did end up, then this was just my wife and I, um, we ended up with five mobile home parks. And like I said, 45 single family doors and three commercial buildings. The commercial buildings were just a, another, you know, process because our business was growing. Mm -hmm. So I started in 2004 by 2009, we were on the Inc fastest growing companies in America. And then I sold in 2014, yep. you know, we ended up with over a hundred employees, but our business was scaling so fast that I bought my first commercial building in like 07. No, it was probably 08. Um, and I, I had to buy another one like a year later because we outgrew that commercial building so fast. And, and then the second one that I bought, same thing, we outgrew it. And so I bought a third one. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, all my early real estate investing, other than the single families, was really just these, you know, opportunities. And I wasn't really looking, I was kind of asset agnostic really in the early days. Yeah. But then when I sold my company in 2014, I still had my real estate portfolio. And then I was kind of like, you know, I've said this before, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but when I sold my business, it was the best and worst day of my life. Cause I'm like, now what? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what's next. And so I just took like a year and a half, two years. I joined the real estate guys mastermind. I just started trying to figure out what's next. And I met my business partner in 2016. And then we teamed up. He or he owned like nine mobile home parks uh, already with a, a couple different investment groups. And so him and I teamed up and then we started scaling, specifically buying mobile home parks. So that's when I got strategic was 2016, 2017, um, you know, just focused on a certain asset class. And honestly, I haven't bought anything but mobile home parks since then. Um, it's been a good, it's been a good run. Yeah, it seems like it. We don't do anything in that space, but got a lot of friends that do and hear a lot about it. And it seems, um, seems really good. I, I want to <clears throat> talk a little bit about that experience of selling the company, it seems like a lot of us are kind of working towards something. And and maybe if you're in a W2, you're working towards a retirement, which is like a super long-term goal. I had something similar when I quit my corporate job in 2015, it was, it was like almost this big emptiness. It's like a kind of a wild experience, but it made me realize like, <laughs> I'd I like to go to work and I want to be working on something. Even if you have a big liquidity event or whatever, that doesn't doesn't change the fact that you need to kind of have some purpose. So mm -hmm. you tackled that by taking a lot of time off, right? A, a year plus. What what did that look like? And what what was that process like for you? You know, it was actually pretty messy because <laughs> I I actually bought back an old business that I had that I had sold just because I was bored. And yeah. that was a waste of time. Um, yeah. I had you know, when I was scaling that business, I had a team there and my assistant, my bookkeeper would do, you know, all my property management. So I kind of had my maintenance in house cause we had a plumbing company. And when I, when I sold, like I actually, I actually got a little office in one of my commercial buildings and I started managing my own properties and, and doing my book. <laughs> like I had this stupid idea that, you know, I'm going to just like manage my own stuff. And man, about 90 days in, I'd walk into the office and there's stacks of bills and things that I haven't put in. And I'm like, this is not where I'm a visionary at my core, but you know, I was just yeah. like, I'm like, what am I going to do now? And so I property management, I bought a business back. I, I should have just went and traveled, but the reality is, you know, and so many of us are thinking that, you know, there's this day coming where, you know, we're going to sell our business or we're going to, you know, like you said, retire from the W2 job and we're going to go sit on a beach somewhere. Mm -hmm. The reason why we love going to the beach is because we just need a week off, not because we want to live there for, you know, three years mm -hmm. straight. And it's like, I just had this huge like epiphany about life at that point in time. And I have a podcast now called Investing for Freedom. And it was really spawned from a lot of that because I think what we think we're looking for sometimes, actually, I know what we're looking for sometimes is not really the outcome that it actually is. I mean, even freedom, we don't want to take three years off. What we want is to just be able to do what we, you know, if I'm not feeling it today or, or one of my kids is in a rough spot, um, I want to be able to take a couple of days off and, and hang out with them. Or if me and the wife need a few days, whatever, great, take it off. But we're not actually looking for, you know, to spend two or three years of our life, um, in silence and just traveling the world. At least most people aren't. And so that was just kind of, that was one of those defining moments for me. And as I look forward, I mean, even now I'm, 
I'll, I'll start businesses and invest the rest of my life. I'm convinced of it. But the mm-hmm. reality at the end of the day is I think we need to have some kind of identity and purpose mm-hmm. outside of our W2 job, outside of our business, outside of our investing, whatever it is for you. Like the, the, the key takeaway for me is whether I'm in plumbing and heating, whether I'm, you know, in the mobile home park space, which we'll probably exit in the next couple of years. Um, what's the next thing? It, it doesn't really matter if I have my identity outside of, you know, Mike, the plumber, Mike, the mobile home park guy, Devin, the multifamily guy, Devin, the helicopter pilot. Like those are just parts of who we are. That's not our pure identity. And so that's probably the most valuable thing that came out of me selling. Yeah. I mean, I really appreciate you diving into that. That was a huge, almost like identity crisis for me. I think when I left my W2, because I had built up this whole thing about, I'm going to have passive income. I'm going to be functionally retired and I'm going to spend all this time with my young family, like all these dreams. And then it just kind of realized like, oh, you don't want to spend seven days a week with your family. Like (laughs) maybe you were working 80 hours a week and you're being a bad dad and husband. And so from that perspective, you're like, God, I just want time with my kids and that's valid, but you don't want all the time with your kids. Like Mm -hmm. there's a balance there. You don't want to go on vacation for for three years. I was talking to a consultant we hired for one of our projects and he's like, I just want to build enough of these projects to just retire off the cash flow." And he's working his tail off. And I was like, what, then what I'm going to sail in the Bahamas. And I was like, all right, man, I don't know if you thought this through, like go for it, but for how long? Like like forever. Cause you're, you're like 40, right? Yeah. I mean, you're going to go sail forever. Like the, ne- the, the second half of your life, or are you going to be like, you know, sunburn and hung over after, I don't know, a month and yeah. you got to go back to back to something. So, but I, you know, what you said about having the option to me, that's kind of everything it's, mm-hmm. I, you know, I actually come to work, come to the office and I love to work. I love to work on projects. I like, I'm a visionary. I like starting stuff. I like growing stuff and hiring people. Um, but the option is completely there to go do, go do something else. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the key is if you've got the, you know, you've got cash flow, you got options. You may choose to do, to, to work all the time, but, you, but having the optionality is like this completely different, uh, level of life, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't sell courses. That doesn't sell books to, to, to talk about the reality of that. Right. It, it, it sells books and courses and whatever else to talk about, you know, um, I don't know, palm trees and myotize or, or, or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. But, the, the pain and suffering of our current situation where you need to run away from like hundred percent, hundred percent. But, um, you know, congratulations for navigating that through the exit of the company and everything. Did you do, did you need to do any kind of earn out with the exit of the, of the company? Or was it just like, Hey, you're handing over the keys one day and close and done. Um, you know, there was a theory around, so it wasn't a direct earn out, but there was a theory around being involved for a period of time. Um, yeah. but I was tied to the company still in the sense that I didn't get paid in one lump sum. Um, in fact, it was sure. a, it was a 10 year buyout. So that actually yep. ends next year. So I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm still part of that. Um, and you yep. know what they did great. They crushed it. There's so many stories about, you know, companies going South, but, um, they yeah. did really, yeah, they did really well. And, um, you That's know, awesome. it was structured in a sense that, like I said, there wasn't a direct earnout where I had to, you know, work for the next three years, but I was tied to them and their, and their success was tied to me in certain areas, but, um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty clean. Yeah, that's awesome. And it sounds like obviously that it didn't fall on its face when you, when you stepped out. So that's pretty cool. Pretty cool story. No. You know, that, so, that was another, just real quick on that note, yeah, that sure, was another course. thing that was like an eye opener for me. You mm-hmm. know, we always say everyone's replaceable. We always talk about that. Yeah. yeah. But at the end of the day, we don't believe that about ourselves and our company. Nope. <laughs> and that was one thing that like, you know, I was literally, when I sold that company, I was kind of like, it's everyone, man. It's not just our key management. It's not just our, you know, employees. It's not, it's everyone. Like I literally built that company from the ground up and they did just fine without me. That's so weird. Was that hard? Was that hard on your ego or? (laughs) Yeah. For, for a few minutes, but, um, you know, I mean, when you really, when you really snap back from it and you look at it and, and you keep that with you, I think it actually gives you a sense of freedom for the future because, Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, we're not valuable in our own organizations, but it almost gives you a sense of, um, a, a deeper understanding around not micromanaging and, and, and letting people have some flexibility to, you know, grow and make mistakes and all of the above, because 
you know, the difference was I wasn't there day in and day out. I'm sure they made plenty of mistakes, you know, without me or did things the way I wouldn't have. And maybe they did some things that were much better. Um, but the reality is when we're just not there, I think we're the problem a lot of times when we're micromanaging, we're babysitting yeah. too hard. Um, I, I've heard David Osborne say this too, but the worst thing you can do is hire good people and not let them do their job. Right. And like yeah. just kind of, you know, babysit them. And, you know, the other side of it, I think one of my weaknesses is hiring somebody and, and throwing them to the wolves too, but oh, um, I'm so bad yeah. at that. Yeah. I'm so too, bad about so. that. Because yeah. you assume they are I like, I assume the best about everybody. I assume they're extremely capable. Um, I personally, and I, I get the sense from you, you know, I'll kind of jump into anything and figure it out. And so I'm like threshold for that ambiguity, super high. And that's just not the case sometimes, but um, yeah, a hundred percent. It's interesting. Our company's about 85 people right now across a couple of different divisions. And I just had this experience the last couple of years where I'm like, I just need to get out of this meeting right now. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm, they're, they're all running it. Like they got it. I need to like, I'm, I'm actually gumming up the gears now by trying to in, in, inject everything. Cause I, I was just so used to being starting as a one man show and trying to kind of grow it up from there. I'm sure you went through the, a, a similar experience there. What's the team look like now with the real estate and the fund and you know, what, what's your day-to-day look like kind of right now? I'm primarily focused right now on investor relations and and the capital side of the business. Um, cool. I have a you know a weekly L10. I've got a director of operations, and then I have my business partner, and then we have a controller. So that's the team you know on the real estate side. That's the main team that I work with. Yeah. Um, you know we have some bigger quarterly meetings with you know the whole team, but my my main corporate team is in Phoenix, and most of the communities are in the Midwest and Southeast. So we have we're vertically integrated um, on the mobile home mm-hmm. park side. So. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got managers, maintenance guys in communities throughout the Midwest and Southeast, but our corporate team's um, seven people. And like I said, I'm primarily focused on the investor relations side. Now, my partner, he used to do all the investor relations and I was the operations side of things. And um, we've kind of, we've kind of shifted gears. I'm working more on the investor relations. And now he works with brokers. We've sold some properties over the last couple of years. We've done a lot of, you know, lending and PE partnerships. And so that's kind of his, that's kind of his area. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I have on my personal portfolio, I've got one person that just kind of manages that up in Nevada. And my wife and I do some other stuff together, um, couples masterminds and some different work. She kind of runs this other company called Vested Media Group, which is more the community side of our business, but that's, that's how it looks. That's cool. So uh, <clears throat> you guys switched tracks um, just because you were better suited on the capital side. You enjoy it more or how did, how did that come about? You know, um, he, he's good at it. Um, but I don't think he ever really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I always thought I wouldn't enjoy it. Um, but I found I enjoy it and I'm pretty good at it. It was just a new skill set for me. So coming out mm-hmm. of like, you know, I never had to raise capital and I wasn't a marketing guy. It was just yeah. a whole new tool, tool set for me. And he actually came out of, he was a talent agent for William Morris for years. Um, and you know, then he launched a couple of different real estate organizations. He was always raising capital. He's really good with people like one-on-one, but he just, he found that he didn't enjoy like doing events and traveling and, mm-hmm. um, you know, building the brand. And so, you know, if you put him in front of a, a family office in New York, he loves it. But when it's out, just raising capital from, you know, accredited investors and just, he, I just don't think he liked being on calls all day. And so we just kind of, I kind of look at it like NASCAR. I just feel like he, you know, he, we kind of just changed spots. So it was kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool to be able to do that and have it, have it worked out. Um, Sometimes people get kind of entrenched in that path and then, you know, they're, they're not changing from that. So we're, we're, we do a lot of multifamily, like multifamily is probably the hardest thing we do from a management perspective. Um, we do some other asset classes, but haven't touched mobile home parks. What is managed? You said you're vertically integrated. What does management look like? Um, on, you know, is it the same for all your parks? Is it the same kind of setup on staff and payroll and everything? Is it, is it different? What does that even look like? You know, it's it's pretty similar. Um, in the mobile home park space, we own about, and, and this is different by different operators, but we own about a third of our homes in the community mm-hmm. and about two thirds of them are owned by the residents. And so mm-hmm. it's definitely, as an industry, it's definitely a different type of management because 
when a resident owns their home, you can't just evict them. And, you know, there's different auction processes and yeah. some of the, I mean, residents are residents at the end of the day. And, and I get that, but I've been involved in a lot of different types of real estate. And I, there's a little bit more handholding sometimes in the manufactured housing space, you know, the way we navigate things. And um, some of the communities are just, by the way, we, our average lot rent is uh, like 375. So these are, you know, these are, these are not like the eight, $900 a month lot rents that you see in Phoenix. Like we're buying, you know, just affordable housing. And so just the mm -hmm. way we manage it is a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. You could take a property manager from a multifamily. In fact, one of our best regionals managed multifamily forever. Um, mm. And she, she picked up pretty quickly. So it's not a whole lot different. It's just kind of the way we, we navigate. And then I think also our managers make, I mean, compared to a lot of property managers, um, they're kind of on a lower price point and a lot of them are part-time too. So it's just navigating the cultural differences, I think is really the the bottom line, but you know, it's, it's pretty similar. Yeah. If, if so in your parks, if there's somebody's got an issue with the house, a plumbing issue or something, is that, is that the management company or that's on the, on the resident to figure out? As so on the two thirds that own their home, that's on them. That's on them. Um, yeah. 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 Anything to do with the house itself is on them. Um, you know, and this is another area just where you have to learn on the management side, because sometimes we don't know why the toilet's backed up. Is it, is it mm -hmm. our problem or is it their problem? And, mm -hmm. and so even just communicating that, because like, if we, if a resident calls and says, Hey, my house is backed up and we're like, well, it's your house, deal with it. Um, that's not a great way to, you know, <laughs> win over your tenant, but we also have to just let them know up front, like, listen, we'll get the plumbing company out here. But if this happens to be on your side, you're going to have to pay for it. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think it's just little communication pieces. It's all communication. Um, yeah. which isn't, I think everything is, and sometimes it's challenging. Yeah, for sure. So in mobile home parks, um, you, are you always buying existing stuff or is there an opportunity to go in and create the new stuff? Um, how, how does that shake out in that, in that space? You know, if you'd asked me this four years ago, I would say, yeah, no, no opportunities in development. Um, and the reason why is because, you know, so many municipalities don't like it. There's the NIMBY conversation, which happens in yep, every, yep. not in my backyard, right? Nobody wants a mobile home park built in there, you know, right behind their million dollar house or whatever the thing is. Sure. And, but I'll tell you, there's some, there's a lot changing in the industry. Um, the homes are beautiful now. Um, municipalities are. are getting, a, yeah, yeah they, they're great. You know, I bought one of them for uh, one of our ranches and I was on a whim. I was just driving down on a ranch with my boys. We stayed in a shack, uh, like literally a cabin. I mean, a a, I don't know, 10 by 15, like barn on cots. And we were driving by this, this mobile home you know, dealership or whatever. We went and checked them out. And I was like, man, I, you know, I used to live in a mobile home when I was very, very young. That was my, you know, I remembered yeah. that. And I was like, these things are amazing. We got like a yeah. three, two and a half with this like modern kitchen and white cabinets. You know, the components aren't the same as the house I live in, but sure. It's a pretty freaking sweet house with AC. And I mean, yeah. I was shocked at the quality of these things. Um, so anyway, not to take it off the, the rails here, but yeah, there's some super nice quality stuff that you can get. And at the time it was a, I said, what, you know, what's a middle of the road product? And he's like, oh, you know, 40,000. And I was like, oh, what's, what's the nicest thing you got, man? I mean, if that's, yeah. if that's what we're talking about. So at the time it was like 85 thousand dollar house and it's uh it's pretty cool man yeah. um so anyway i mean they, they are nice now and that's i wonder is that is that is there a stigma around that stuff and is stigma changing because of the quality and what's you know you're in it every day what's your sense of that well yeah i, I think it is to some degree but you know unless unless you're in it or a resident i don't it's it's still pretty challenging to change the stigma i think in the long run mm -hmm. um you yeah. know and on that note too like our average house completely set in one of our communities is $55,000 for a three bedroom, two bath. That's incredible. Well, that's I mean, really, you, it's incredible. Yeah, that's really hard to beat. And mm -hmm. with our financing, like we can get the average, you know, even whether they buy it or rent it, you know, they're paying between 900 and 980 a month all in with the lot rent and the home. Like that's just, yeah, that's, that's yeah. And you know, affordable housing isn't going anywhere, but back to the development mm. thing. Um, there was a, the white house came out and this has been going on for a few years now. Ben Carson's actually the, 
um, he's a big advocate. He speaks at almost all the manufactured housing association mm -hmm. events. They've really been pushing um, municipalities and stuff to open up to more affordable housing and manufactured housing is a big part of it. Sure. So I think over, you know, the next one to five years, I think you're going to see a lot more um, cities incentivize development of manufactured home communities. And the other thing I'll say, you can go right to the White House website. I think it was last May and just Google, you know, White House, affordable housing, manufactured housing incentives. They're actually, um, they're working on getting Fannie Mae to finance the homes themselves, which is, oh, what, wow. Oh, that'll man. be a game changer. Um, game cause, changer. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's the biggest challenge right now is banks don't want to finance these because they're not, you know, they're not, they're not real estate. They're, they're mm -hmm. personal property. Yeah, and so that's been one of the biggest challenges in the industry, but I think you're going to see that change. Wow. Yeah. Um, and they don't need much, right? I mean, it doesn't need to be in some dense mm -hmm. infill area. It doesn't need a, a ton in terms of utilities or amenities or anything like that. I mean, you really just kind of need some dirt and run some, run some electric and water to it. Right. And it doesn't need to be in the middle of the city or anything. Right. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I think about that all the time. And um, that price point is wild. I didn't realize that's kind of where this stuff was shaken out. I mean, if you look at, you know, even B and C class multifamily, you're, you're spending 12, $1,300 mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times for a two bedroom, you know, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that's, um, that's wild. Interesting. Um, cool. Well, I appreciate kind of diving in on that. Always interested to learn about stuff that we don't, that we don't do on a daily basis. Um, well, Mike, this has been awesome. I mean, you got a lot, a lot of hard one knowledge, overgrowing and selling a business, real estate. What do you say to, to you, you know, or that kid that's, that's starting now or that, or that guy or gal that wants to be an entrepreneur and are, are kind of just thinking about it or just starting to make a go of it. What is, you, you know, what, what are you looking back with some hard one wisdom now tell that person that's starting out? So I have to say this with a caveat first, because I think my risk tolerance is pretty high. It was yeah. much higher when yeah. I was younger and I'm sure yours is too, but yeah. so I'm not telling you to just jump off a cliff, but you know, I say this all the time, it's impossible to steer a parked car. So right. meaning like just get moving and then you can adjust your directions along the way. When I talk to a Devin or a Mike or, you know, any, we've, we've made more mistakes than than most people will make in their life. It's just, we just adapt and overcome quick. And the faster you get moving toward your dreams and goals, the faster you're going to be able to fail and the faster you're going to be able to adjust. And that's what I mean by it's impossible to steer a parked car. Most people are just, you know, they're frozen with fear. They're parked in their driveway. They're thinking about all the places they want to go in life. And you're just never going to get there because you're just, you, you got to turn the car on and you got to start driving and then we'll figure out along the way how to get there. And I think that's what separates, you know, those that do from those that don't. Um, and, and honestly, the, the, the older and farther along you get in life and the more you have to lose, the harder it is, um, to make those, you know, decisions that fortunately I, I made it at the age of 24 and I'm glad I did because if I was 34 or 44, like I am today, mm -hmm. it would be a lot harder to start mm -hmm. moving toward those goals. So um, that's what I'd leave them with. It's impossible to steer a parked car. So just get moving. I love it. Great analogy and, and great wisdom there. So thank you for sharing that. If somebody wants to connect Mike and learn more about your world, um, what's a good avenue aside from the investing for freedom pod that you host that they can go, I'm sure look up on any of the platforms. Um, how else can they connect? Uh, I have a, a free download they could get at velocityventurepartners.com forward slash download. It's a, it's a white paper on why affluent investors prefer private placement. It's a great read. Um, so yeah, just velocityventurepartners.com. Awesome. We'll link to that in the show notes. If you're listening, you scroll through and check out, uh, check out that download, check out the podcast. Mike, it was great catching up, man. Thank you for, for jumping on and uh, love hearing about all the adventures and lessons learned. Um, so thank you. Wish you success in your head. Catch up soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. See you. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.